the introduction. Um, so for the next talk, I'm going to be speaking about management and prevention of infection in IBD. So for the first part, I'll speak about some common infections uh, we see in our practice, C. diff, pneumonia, herpes zoster, talk briefly about vaccinations, and at the end of the talk, I have one slide of enteric infections in, associated with IBD. I think we'll be hearing more about that over the next few years. So first, how does C. diff present in IBD versus non-IBD patients? So usually with IBD, our patients are going to be younger, more likely community acquired than antibiotic associated. You're going to see more steroid use on colonoscopy, where usually with C. diff, you see pseudomembranes. With IBD patients, you don't see those pseudomembranes often. If you look at asymptomatic colonization rates, over 8% of IBD patients have been shown to be colonized with C. diff much lower than the general population. And when you're looking at recurrent C. diff, one study shows significantly higher recurrence rates. So 34% in the IBD patients versus 25% in the general population. And as you know, with one recurrence, you're more likely to have the second recurrence and third recurrence and so on. C. diff in IBD has worse outcomes. Specifically looking at surgery, I listed a few different studies here. Uh, one study from the Mass General Database showed that one-year colectomy rates comparing C. diff in UC versus UC alone. Um, the C. diff in UC patients had a 44% colectomy rate at one year versus 25% in C. diff alone. And two different meta-analyses show pretty much a two-fold risk, increased risk of surgery when you have C. diff with UC versus UC alone. What about mortality? Um, this one study comes out of Canada. It was a prospective cohort study looking at hospitalized patients, about 1,800 IBD patients. 10% of them had C. diff. And you could look at the five-year um, hazard ratios and the mortality rate adjusted hazard ratio is 2.41. So C. diff, higher recurrence rates, higher colectomy rates, and possibly higher mortality rates. So a big issue. When you're managing C. diff in IBD, I think in the past they used to separate non-severe C. diff versus severe C. diff, flagell versus vancomycin. I think many of us always thought C. diff with IBD was more complicated and used vancomycin. The more updated infectious disease guidelines show first-line therapy for C. diff in adult patients should be vancomycin or fidoxamycin. Flagels really dropped off. So I don't think there's much of a discussion now for first-line treatment. I think it gets a little more complicated or controversial is what do you do with IBD therapy when somebody has C. diff. So first looking at steroids, there's been a handful of steroids looking at, uh, sorry, a handful of studies looking at steroids um, use with C. diff, and there's been an increased mortality risk. This, however, has been shown in many of the studies only a small percentage of IBD patients. Some studies show worse outcomes with steroids, IBD, and C. diff. Some studies show no difference in outcomes. When you're looking at immunosuppressive um, use, similar things, conflicting results. One study showed the more immunosuppressive, the second one you added on, the third one you added on, you had more negative outcomes uh, with C. diff and IBD versus another study of Mass General showing immunosuppressive use really wasn't a big deal. And if you look at the ACG guidelines, they sort of hedge, right? They say, well, if you have C. diff and you put them on treatment, maybe it's a good idea you should wait about 72 hours before considering um, immunosuppressive use, but there's really no good data showing that. So a group of us in New York thought, you know, why don't we get together, see if we could get more data, help better answer the question. So what we did was, it was uh, four centers in, you, in, the, in New York City looking at about a little over 200 patients uh, with C. diff and IBD. And what we were trying to look at was this therapy escalation. Um, is, is that associated with worsening outcomes? So we defined escalation of therapy or intensification of therapy was starting steroids, starting a biologic agent, or increasing the dose of a biologic. And the outcomes we were looking at at 90 days were death, sepsis, um, and colectomy. And we had some secondary variables of interest. So the res looking at the results, the median time to therapy uh, escalation was about 13 days, and about a third of the patients were escalated within a week. And looking at the outcomes. So the, all patients but one that had a severe outcome, so again, sepsis, colectomy, or death, were all patients that were not escalated. So if you, well, the one patient that had a negative outcome was a patient, an inpatient, severe UC, got a dose of infliximab, and within a couple of days um, required surgery. So really when you're thinking about how to manage your IBD and C. diff patient, obviously if your patient's flaring, increased diarrhea, you're going to check C. diff. If they're C. diff positive, first time you're going to use vancomycin. 
And I really wouldn't been, would not be hesitant to escalate IBD therapy depending on the situation. I don't think you need to wait a certain amount of time as long as, in my mind, the vancomycin's on board. If that patient's flaring, um, I'm very much going to move on to the next therapy. All right, moving on to pneumonia. So community-acquired pneumonia is the leading cause of infectious death in the United States. The most common agent is pneumococcal pneumonia, about 36%. There was a nice study done published in 2013 looking at the rates of pneumonia in, the I, in IBD versus the general population. So this was a large um, retrospective cohort study. This database had about 100,000 patients with IBD, 400,000 controls. And what you could see here that the, there was an increased risk of pneumonia in the IBD patient population with a hazard ratio of about 1.5. Interestingly, if you looked at hospitalized patients, so hospitalized IBD patients, were that, incident, that incidence ratio went up to 2.7. So from 1.5 to 2.7 if you had IBD. And a separate study actually looked at mortality rates for inpatients with infections. And so if you have, you're an inpatient, you have IBD, you have an infection like pneumonia, you're more, you have a higher mortality rate than if you have pneumonia without IBD. So this is a, a big deal for our patients. If you look in the data a little more deeply, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis patients had increased incidence rates of pneumonia. And what they did with this, they also did a case control design to look at different drug exposures and to see if that affected pneumonia risk. What you could see here is TNF, PPI, it's not listed here, but narcotics all also increased risk of pneumonia in our IBD patients, but steroids were the worst actors. So obviously this is gonna be important for vaccination and something I'll speak about um, in a few more slides. All right, moving on to herpes zoster. So about a third of people in the general population get herpes zoster. About 10 to 18 percent of these patients develop a post-herpetic neuralgia. Um, there's a handful of studies looking at zoster rates in the IBD population versus the general population, and there seems to be an increased risk of herpes zoster in the IBD population. Steroids seems to be a bad actor. There was an oral presentation at this past DDW using the national inpatient, inpatient sample looking at hospital admissions. So IBD patients with um, herpes zoster were twice as likely to be admitted to the hospital versus non-IBD patients with herpes zoster. So why is herpes zoster such a big thing and you're hearing more and more about it? And um, as was mentioned earlier, tofacitinib, um, one of the JAK inhibitors, was just approved for ulcerative colitis at the end of May. Now this has been on the market since 2012 for rheumatoid arthritis and about a year ago or so for psoriatic arthritis. So we have some data looking at zoster risk with this drug. So this was done in a rheumatologic journal um, looking at a real-world experience of about 2,500 patients on tofacitinib, 45, 50,000 anti-TNF patients, and then a few other, a few other thousand of different biologics that, or, or different immune suppressants and biologics used in RA patients. And you could see here that tofacitinib had a two-fold increased risk over these other uh, medications for herpes zoster. So this was just um, published online in the IBD journal. Um, so what Pfizer did, the company that um, brought tofacitinib to the market, they looked at all of their clinical trial data. So they had over 1,100 patients that were treated with this drug in their clinical trial program. And they were followed for about four years, and I think this was the study, or the study ended in December 2016 when they looked back. And you could see here that 65 or 5.6 of the percent of the patients developed herpes zoster with an incidence rate of a little over four. Who were these patients? 40% were female, median age was 52, but there was a wide range. And the median time to develop herpes zoster was a little under a year, but again, a wide range. Some people as early as a couple of weeks and out to over three years. To go in a little deeper, what, what these patients were really see, uh, developing. So again, 65 or 5.6% developed zoster. 74% of these events, though, were mild to moderate, meaning just one or two dermatomes that were involved. 12 events in 11 patients were multidermatomal. So in this, this was defined as three to six dermatomes. And six patients had disseminated zoster. So three had diffuse cutaneous rash, so more than six dermatomes. Two had ocular and skin lesions, and one actually developed herpes zoster encephalitis, and this was successfully treated with IVA cyclovir. Less than 10% of patients that developed zoster had to completely discontinue the drug and discontinue this study, but about a quarter of them temporarily held drug, 
Now, try and, they also looked at what were the risk factors for developing zoster if you're on tofacitinib and UC. And these were similar risk factors that have come up in the rheumatoid arthritis and uh, patient population as well as the psoriatic arthritis. So for unclear reasons, Asian patients tend to develop um, zoster at a higher rate. Uh, patients with diabetes, steroids at baseline, prior anti-TNF failure, and then age is a big factor. And on a multivariate analysis, the, um, the two things that popped up were age and prior anti-TNF fa failure, which increased your risk for zoster. So at the table at the bottom, you could see that this zoster occurrence is dose dependent. So on the left, looked at the maintenance cohort, and on the right, looked at the entire drug development program, phase two, phase three induction, maintenance, and opal label and, um, extension. And what you could see is the 10 milligram twice a day dose had higher rates of zoster than the 5 milligram twice a day dose. And I think the absolute rate for the 5 milligram dose was a little less than 2% and over 5% for the 10 milligram dose. All right, so this I think leads nicely into the next part of the talk, which is vaccinations. So what is the problem? This is a little bit of an older study, but I think it uh, brings up a good point about educating our patients. So this was done in Cedar sinai As patients walked into the clinic, they gave them a survey about vaccinations, and 169 patients completed the survey, and they asked them um, about you know, how often they've been uh, vaccinated. So 86% of them have been currently on immunosuppressive or biologics or previously exposed. Only about 30% received the Hep B vaccine and the flu vaccine and only 9% received the pneumonia vaccine. And the biggest reason was lack of awareness. So we're not doing a good enough job educating our patients. Now what's the other problem? Who should vaccinate the patients? So the top study was a survey sent out by the ACG. I think they sent out over 1,000 surveys. We weren't very excited about it. Only 100 GI doctors actually responded. Um, but with, only about half of them said that they actually took a vaccination history. 20 to 30% not that they are vaccinating, they're giving live virus vaccines to immunosuppressed patients. 20 to 30% said that they would. And I think very interestingly, two thirds said, look, this isn't my issue. See your primary care doc, they'll vaccinate you. Um, a similar study was done, smaller study with a group of family practitioners, and they're like, I don't know what these immunosuppressives biologics are, talk to your GI about vaccination. So I think bottom line, as the IBD physician, we should be responsible. In my office, we don't have vaccines, but definitely myself, my nurses, my staff, make sure that our patients get vaccinated. We talk to their primary care, and I think it's our responsibility to do so. This is just a list of all inactivated vaccines, and uh, Frank Ferre has updated guidelines for healthcare maintenance um, in the Red Journal, so you could all take a look at that. I'm not going to go through it line by line, but these are the ones recommended for our IBD patients. Uh, two things to bring up. First, as I mentioned about pneumonia, all of our patients should be getting the pneumonia vaccine. They should get the Prevnar um, 13 vaccine, and then within two to 12 months later, be getting the Pneumovax. Possibly five years later, another dose of the Pneumovax, and then they're done. Um, and then the flu vaccine. So I do recommend flu vaccine to all my patients. I would say out of everything I recommend, the flu vaccine are one of those things where patients just don't want to take, at least in my experience. They think they're going to get the flu. It's a bad reaction. They're picking the wrong strains. Um, but, you know, just on the, in the airport on the way over here, there was this, I just read a study that came out of Penn State Hershey, similar to what was done with the pneumonia and zoster studies, looking at influenza rates in IBD patients. And similarly, higher rates of flu in IBD patients versus the general population from this market scan database, but also higher rates of hospitalization with the flu. So hopefully with this information, I don't have my, I'm not so confident, but hopefully with some of this information, I can convince more patients to get the flu vaccine. These are some live virus vaccines um, that are recommended. If you're, obviously you can't get a live virus vaccine if you're immune suppressed, you want to wait at least a month before starting an immune suppressant. The big one here is a herpes zoster. I'm going to talk about the Shingrix in a sec, but this was the only option we had to vaccinate our patients for zoster was with Zostafax, which is a live virus vaccine, um, but that's no more. We now have the Shingrix vaccine. So this is a recombinant killed vaccine. Um, the CDC recommends two doses, the initial dose and then two to six months later, and it's recommended for immunocompetent patients over the age of 50. And when you look at their clinical trial data, the outcomes of the vaccine response has been better than the Zostafax, way over 90 percent, whether you're age 50, 60, 70, or older. We really don't have any, any data for our younger patients, for our patients on immunosuppressive therapy, um, but as, this is something we're hoping to have some more of as we have more patients on JAK inhibitors.
And then just one slide on enteric infections in IBD, and we heard a little bit from Steve's talk about the microbiome and dysbiosis and pathogenesis of IBD. So obviously dysbiosis is a big factor, and enteric infections affect our gut bacteria, which could then, you know, lead to um, downstream immunological effects for our IBD patients. So um, Jordan Axelrod, who just joined faculty at NYU, while he was a fellow at Columbia, I don't know how many of you are sending this GI PCR pathogen panel or biofire panel, but he wanted to see how often it was sent um, at Columbia, and thousands and thousands of patients were getting it over the years, and also sort of what bugs were picked up versus, with IBD patients versus controls. And you could see here that for ulcerative colitis patients, C. diff and E. coli popped up more than the controls, and for Crohn's, viruses, especially norovirus, were picked up more for um, Crohn's and controls. And Peter Higgins presented similar work that, at DDW from his, um, uh, from his cohort at University of Michigan. So I think next step with this is sort of looking at outcomes, and Peter Higgins described that a little bit, but outcomes of these infections, but also maybe in getting a better understanding on how these infections change our microbiome, how that then affects the immune system, and maybe could give us more insight to infectious triggers of IBD. So just to summarize, um, C. diff, much more common in our IBD patients, higher recurrence rates, um, higher collectory rates, and in some studies, higher mortality rates. So we want to make sure we're checking treating with vancomycin at least first line, and then we shouldn't be hesitant to escalate our IBD therapy. Um, IBD patients across the board have low vaccination rates, um, but this is something we need to educate our patients about, recommending the flu vaccine, the pneumonia vaccine, possibly the Shingrix vaccine. You know, there's some data that immunosuppressive therapy, especially combination therapy, patients might not mount as good of a response to certain vaccines like the pneumonia vaccine, but that shouldn't deter us from recommending vaccination. Um, Zoster, we're going to be hearing more about it with tofacitinib on the market. Um, again, in their clinical trial data, a little over 5% developed it. Most of them were mild to moderate reactions, uncomplicated, and most of the patients were able to continue drug. I think with Shingrix now on the market, although I think it's um, back ordered right now, I think that will help. However, it's important to realize that we only have data on patients 50 years and older that are immunocompetent. I am recommending Shingrix for all my patients starting on JAK inhibitors, but there's really limited data for that.